Hello everybody and welcome to this video. It's a continuation of my series on William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet and as always if you find this video useful please do give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We are in Act 2 Scene 4 and this scene takes place in a street starting off with Benvolio and Mercutio. Mercutio says where the devil should this Romeo be? Came he not home tonight? In other words where's Romeo? Didn't he go home tonight? And Benvolio says, not to his father's, I spoke with his man. So in other words, he didn't go home to his family home, to his dad's house. I spoke with one of the men there. Mercutio says, ah, that same pale, hard-hearted wench, that Rosaline, torments him so that he will sure run mad. So in other words, that horrible, tough Rosaline is upsetting him so much, he's going he's gonna to go nuts. And again, this is dramatic irony where we as the audience know no, that's not the case. You know, he's forgotten all about Rosaline. Benvolio says, Tybalt, the kinsman of old Capulet, hath sent a letter to his father's house. So Tybalt, relative of Capulet, has sent a letter um, to Romeo. Now, this is obviously following Romeo's intrusion at the party. Tybalt has acted. Um, Mercutio guesses the purpose of the letter a challenge on my life. In other words, I bet it's a challenge to fight. Benvolio says, Romeo will answer it. So Romeo will answer that letter. And Mercutio, with a bit of wordplay, a bit of a pun, says, any man that can write may answer a letter. You know, basically saying, well, yeah, you know, anyone who can write can answer a letter. Yes, he'll answer it. He'll write back. Benvolio obviously didn't mean Romeo will write back. So Benvolio says, no, he will answer the letter's master, how he dares, being dared. So in other words, no, what I mean is, he will answer Tybalt by fighting him. Mercutio says, alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead, stabbed with the white wench's black eyes, shot through the ear with a love song, the very pin of his heart cleft with this blind bow boy's butt shaft, and is he a man to encounter Tybalt? So basically, Tybalt, uh, sorry, Mercutio is again foreshadowing Romeo is already dead. Uh, more on this in the next video, and in my ebook, I go into this analysis in detail, which you can pick up by following the link in the description. But basically, he's saying Romeo's already dead because he's so in love, he's going to die from the look of a woman or a love song, or his heart will be broken by an arrow from Cupid's bow. So, therefore, because he's so kind of weakly in love, is he brave enough to fight Tybalt? Benvolio says, why? What is Tybalt? In other words, you know, well, what's so special about Tybalt that Romeo wouldn't be able to fight him? And then Mercutio tells us a bit about Tybalt, which is quite bizarre, really, coming, bearing in mind what happens later in Act 3, Scene 1, um, that Mercutio here praises Tybalt and his skill and says, more than Prince of Cats, I can tell you, oh, he is the courageous captain of compliments. He fights as you sing prick song, keeps time, distance, and proportion, rests me his min in rest, one, two, and the third in your bosom, the very butcher of a silk button, a duelist, a duelist, a gentleman of the very first house, of the first and second cause, oh, the immortal passado, the puntal reversal, the hail. So basically what he's saying is Tybalt, um, and the name Prince of Cats and Tybalt is a legendary name, a story the audience would have known well. And he's saying, well, you know, Tybalt's more than that. He's courageous, he fights really well. You know, he fights almost like a dance where he rests, counts, and then jumps, and you're stabbed in the heart. He's had a lot of um, sort of schooling in fighting and how to duel, and he knows the forward thrust, the backward thrust, the thrust which goes right through your heart, which is uh, the... Well, the sort of moves that um, Mercutio is talking about. Benvolio says, the what? And Mercutio says, the pox of such antic, lisping, affecting fantasios, these new tuners of accents by Jesu. So he's basically moving on and saying, I hate these silly men who talk with like the most recent popular accent. They put on a, a false way of speaking. And he's saying... A very good blade, a very tall man, very good. Hang on two seconds. Uh, so he's saying, I hate people who put on these funny voices and accents and say, Ew, a very good blade, a very tall man, a very good whore. Why is not this a lamentable thing, grandsire, that we should be thus afflicted with these strange flies, these fashion mongers, these pardon 
pardon me, who stand so much on the new form that they cannot at ease of the old bench. Oh, their bones, their bones. So he's basically criticizing people who, you know, speak in this very uh, particular type of way just to be fashionable. And they uh, cry, oh, my aching bones. So he's just criticizing people who use phrases and ways of speaking just to be fashionable. And then Romeo arrives. So Benvolio says, here comes Romeo, here comes Romeo. I don't think that bit needs translation. Mercutio straight in with the bawdy banter again says, Without his row like a dried herring, flesh, flesh, how art thou fishified? Now is he for the numbers that Petrarch flowed in. Laura to his lady was but a kitchen wench, marry. So basically he's saying that uh, Romeo's like a dried fish without eggs, and he's ready for Petrarch's love poetry, and we analysed Petrarch's love poetry earlier in this video series. He's talking, saying that Laura, um, who Petrarch loved, obviously, when compared to his lady, who he thinks is Rosaline, is nothing but a kitchen slave. Um, Mary, she had a better love to write. So basically he's saying, you know, well, Petrarch was a better writer than Romeo is. And then Cleopatra, a gypsy, Helen and Hero, Hildings and Harlots, this be a grey eye or so, but not to the purpose. So he's basically saying all of these women from history and mythology who were famous and beautiful and powerful and nothing but sluts and prostitutes when compared to Romeo's what he thinks is Rosaline. Now, of course, this isn't about Rosaline anymore. Signor Romeo, bonjour. There's a French salutation to your French slop. You gave us the counterfeit fairly last night. So he's basically saying, hello, Romeo, I'm talking to you in French because you're acting like a Frenchman. You cheated us last night. Romeo says, good morrow to you both. What counterfeit did I give you? So, you know, good morning. What did I do to wrong you? So Mercutio says, the slip, sir, the slip, can you not conceive? So you disappeared, don't you remember? Romeo says, pardon, good Mercutio. My business was great, and in such a case as mine, a man may strain courtesy. In other words, I'm really sorry that I disappeared, but I had something really important to do, and it was so important that actually it's okay for me to be rude and go away. You know, politeness doesn't sort of come into it when you had something to do like I had to do. And Mercutio says, that's as much to say such a case as yours constrains a man to bow in the hands. So it's basically a confusing line, but he's saying, you know, well, what you're saying is that you went off and had sex and that's more important than spending time with us. So again, Mercutio is not right here. Romeo says, meaning to curtsy, so I shake my buttocks just to curtsy, so a bit of word play and banter that goes on now for a bit. Mercutio says, thou hast most kindly hit it, so you got it right. Romeo says, a most courteous exposition, what a polite explanation. And Mercutio says, nay, I am the very pink of courtesy, and the very pink flower of politeness, he's saying. And uh, Romeo says, pink for flower, so he's saying, you know, pink flower as in a a woman's genitals. And Mercutio says, right. And Romeo says, why then is my pump well flowered? So in other words, you know, if pink flowers are women's genitals, then uh, I've had plenty of pink flowers. I've, um, you know, had lots of sex. So this is a return to Romeo's very uh, rude and kind of bawdy sense of humour that he lost when he was with Juliet. With Juliet, he was using the language of religion to express his feelings, and now he's back to the kind of laddish humour. Well said, follow me this jest now till thou hast worn out thy pump, then when the single soul of it is worn, the jest may remain after the wearing soul singular. So he's saying, you know, this junk, this joke is worn out now. Um, there's nothing left. And Romeo says, oh, single soul jest solely singular for the singleness. Oh, what a bad joke. Everything we're saying is just stupidity. And Mercutio says, come between us, good Benvolio, my wits faint. So come and break it up, Benvolio. That's what you always seem to be doing. I'm losing this battle. I've had enough of it. Romeo says, switch and spurs, switch and spurs, or I'll cry a match. So he's saying, you know, carry on. Um, get the horse going again. Whip it and dig his spurs in. Because if you give up, then I shall just declare myself the winner. To which Mercutio replies, Nay, if thy wits run the wild goose chase, I have done, for thou hast more of the wild goose in one of thy wits than I am sure I have in my whole five. Was I with you there for the goose? So he's basically saying, No, we're on a wild goose chase here. I'm never going to win. You're much cleverer than me. 
you know, did I even keep up with the goose? Um, Romeo says, and there's a lot of jokes now about geese, which are not the most interesting part of the play. Romeo says, thou wast never with me for anything when thou wast not there for the goose. So he's saying, you never, you never kept up with me in my joking. Mercutio says, I will bite thee by the ear for that jest. So I'll get you for that. I'm going to bite you. And Romeo says, nay, good goose, do not bite. Don't bite me, goose. Mercutio says, thy wit is a very bitter sweeting. It is a most sharp source. So your humour is hurtful. It's hard to take. And Romeo says, and is it not well served into a sweet goose? So, well, that bitter sauce is great to serve with geese. And like you, Mercutio says, oh, here's a wit of cheveral that stretches from an inch narrow to an L broad. So he's saying, oh, you're stretching the joke too wide, too thin. And Romeo says, I stretch it out for that word broad, so I will stretch it out further. And uh, this really is a kind of return to the more childish behaviour of Romeo, which added to the goose proves the far and wide abroad goose. Now Mercutio says, why? Is not this better now than groaning for love? So he's kind of saying, look, come on, Romeo, it's better to have a banter and joking than to be upset all the time moaning about love and who loves you and who doesn't love you? Now art thou sociable, now art thou Romeo, now art thou what thou art, by art as well as by nature. For this drivelling love is like a great natural that runs lolling up and down to hide his bauble in a hole. So he's saying, you know, you're much more fun to be around when you're not depressed about love. You are what you are supposed to be, what nature made you to be when you're happy. Because if you're depressed, it's just like an idiot who runs up and down a hill looking for a hole to hide his toy in. And Ben Valio says, stop there, stop there, let's stop all this now. And Mercutio says, thou desirest me to stop in my tail against the hair. So he's saying, you want me to stop my story before I've even finished it. And ben Valio says, thou wouldst else have made thy tail large. You know, yes, I am telling you to shush and shut up now because else you're going to go on forever. Mercutio says, oh, thou art deceived, I would have made it short, for I was come to the whole depth of my tale, and meant indeed to occupy the argument no longer. So Mercutio is basically saying, well, you're wrong there, because my story was done, and I got to the end anyway. Now, the nurse appears with Peter, who's her kind of, uh, one of the other servants in the house, and um, here comes the nurse. So Romeo sees her and says, here's goodly gear, here's something good. And Mercutio says, a sail, a sail. So this is a, a pun. He's joking as if a ship is approaching. So we get the idea perhaps the nurse isn't the smallest or most petite of women. And uh, it's a joke on her size. Benvolio says, two, two, a shirt and a smock. So a man and a woman, there's two of them. The nurse says, Peter. And the Peter says, anon, you know, I am here. And the nurse says, my fan, Peter, give me my fan. So she's fanning herself. And Mercutio says, a good Peter to hide her face, for her fan's the fairer face. So he's basically saying, you're going to use that fan to hide the nurse's face because she's so ugly, the fan is actually more pretty looking than her. The nurse says, good, you good, moral gentleman, you know, good morning. And Mercutio says, God, you good den, fair gentlewoman, good afternoon. The nurse says, is it good then? Is it afternoon? And Mercutio says, tis no less, I tell you, for the bawdy hand of the dial is now upon the prick of noon. So he's basically saying, oh yes, it's midday, because the hand of the clock uh, is aroused and erect, sticking straight up at noon. So he's basically saying, you know, yes, it's uh, noon, because you've come and turned me on, and I've got an erection with you being here. And the nurse um, understands his bawdy humour. Of course, the nurse herself often uses this rude sort of humour. So she's not naive and innocent and doesn't understand this. She says, out upon you, what a man are you? You know, how, go away. How can you speak to me like this? How rude. And Romeo says, um, one gentlewoman that God hath made for himself to mar. So in other words, this is a man that God has made and this man is going to ruin himself. The nurse says, By my troth it is well said for himself to mar. Quoth a gentleman, Can any of you tell me where I may find the young Romeo? So basically, yeah, you're telling the truth. He will ruin his own life. Now, does anyone know where I can find Romeo? Now, this is strange, isn't it? Because the nurse looked at Romeo at the party. 
So just the night before, and Romeo says, I can tell you, but young Romeo will be older when you have found him than he was when you asked for him. So yes, I can tell you where young Romeo uh, is, but by the time I tell you where young Romeo is, he won't be young Romeo anymore because 10 seconds will have passed and he'll be older. So Romeo is joining in, uh, kind of being a little bit rude and uh, sort of sarcastic towards the nurse, which isn't very nice, is it? He, you know, maybe perhaps he doesn't know who she is. Um, but he is certainly awaiting a message from Juliet, so he wouldn't have to be a, a genius to work out this is it. The nurse says, you say well, you know, you speak well. And Mercutio says, yea, is the worst well, very well took, in faith, wisely, wisely. So is the worst well. The nurse says, if you be he, sir, I desire some confidence with you. This is uh, something I analyse in the um, e-book uh, in detail, but the nurse here uses words that she doesn't mean to use, so she probably does, means to use the word conference here. She said, well, if you're Romeo, I'd like to speak to you. Benvolio says, she will invite him to some supper. You know, she'll invite him to a meal. Mercutio thinks then he's worked out what she is. She says, a board, a board, a board, so ho. So he, he thinks the nurse is a pimp. He thinks he's worked out that the nurse is a pimp come to talk about, um, you know, some prostitute. Romeo says, what hast thou found? What have you worked out? And Mercutio says, no hair, sir, unless a hair, sir, and a lantern pie. That is something stale and whore. Eat it. So Mercutio says she's not a prostitute because she's too ugly to be a prostitute herself. And then he sings. So Mercutio is in high spirits in this scene and again is revealed to be quite a reckless and uncontrollable character an old hair whore and an old hair whore is very good meat in lent but a hair that is whore is too much for a score when it whores it ere it be spent romeo will you come to your father's will to dinner thither so he's singing a song about old rabbit meat being good to eat if it's all you, but that you can get but old rabbit meat is no good when it rots before you eat it so he's saying you know it's okay to have an old woman, but not if she's rotten. And then he says, you coming to your dad's for dinner? Romeo says, I will follow you. You know, I'll be there in a bit. Mercutio says, farewell, ancient lady, farewell. And he sings, lady, lady, lady. So he's just saying, bye, old woman, and sings. And off go Mercutio and Benvolio. And the nurse says, my farewell, I pray you, sir. What saucy merchant was this that was so full of his ropery? In other words, you know. Who were these men who were so, so rude and full of themselves? So Romeo says, a gentleman nurse that loves to hear himself talk. So a man who loves nothing more than to hear the sound of his own voice. Um, and will speak more in a minute than he will stand to in a month. So in other words, you know, he says all these things, but he doesn't do it. He's just all, all mouth and no trousers, as the, the saying goes. And the nurse says, and to speak anything against me, I'll take him down, and I were lustier than he is, and twenty such jacks, and if I cannot, I'll find those that shall. So basically, you know, I don't care who he is, if he speaks badly to me, I'll just, I'll, I'll deck him, and if I can't, I'll get a group together who can. And scurvy knave, I am none of his flirt gills, I am none of his skeins mates, and thou must stand by me too by two and suffer every knave to use me at this pleasure so now she's talking to the to peter and she's saying you know what you just stood there while these men were horrible to me peter says and again this is very humorous i saw no man use you a pleasure if i had my weapon should quickly have been out i warrant you i dare draw as soon as another man if i see occasion in a good quarrel and the law on my side so he's saying well i didn't see anyone was being mean to you if i had i would have pulled my sword out straight away as long as I could have done so lawfully. And again, you know, that's humorous because, of course, Peter was stood there whilst all that was being said. The nurse says, Now afore God I am so vexed that every part about me quivers. Scurvy knave, pray you, sir, a word. And as I told you, my young lady bade me inquire you out. What she bade me say I will keep to myself. But first let me tell you, if you should lead her into a fool's paradise, as they say, it were a very gross kind of behaviour as they say, for the gentlewoman is young, and therefore, if you should deal double with her, truly it were an ill thing to be offered to any gentlewoman, and very weak dealing. Now, you can see the full translation on the screen there, but basically what she's saying is, 
I've got a message to bring you, but let me tell you first, if you're messing about with Juliet, if you're just playing her and you're breaking her heart, then that's really mean. But Romeo says, Nurse, commend me to thy lady and mistress. I protest unto thee. So he's saying, look, tell Juliet how good I am. I, you know, I, I really, you know, beg you. And the nurse interrupts him and says, Good heart and in faith, I will tell her as much. Lord, Lord, she will be a joyful woman. So this again is humorous because the nurse doesn't know what she's going to tell Juliet. She says, okay, I'll tell her. She'll be happy. Romeo says, what will thou tell her, nurse? Thou dost not mark me. So what are you going to tell her? You're not even listening to me. And the nurse says, I will tell her, sir, that you did protest, which, as I take it, is a gentleman-like offer. Now this is a malapropism here where the nurse actually is meaning to use the word propose. But again, it's humorous because she said, I'm going to tell her that you protest. And that's a great thing to say. So Romeo must be rolling his eyes here thinking, oh, this woman's stupid. She's going to get me in trouble here. So Romeo says, bid her devise some means to come to shrift this afternoon. And there she shall at Friar Lawrence's cell be shrived and married. Here is for thy pains. So he says, look, get Juliet to find some reason to go to confession this afternoon. And when she's there at Friar Lawrence's, we'll get married. And then he gives the nurse some money and says, you know, that." Take that, you know, take a little bit of money. And she says, no, truly, sir, not a penny. I don't want it. Romeo says, go to, I say you shall. Go on, go away. And the nurse takes the money. Often a, an ancient custom to say no, but, or, you know, even if you wanted the money. This afternoon, sir, well, she shall be there, says the nurse. And Romeo says, and stay, good nurse, behind the abbey wall. Within this hour, my man shall be with thee, and bring thee cords made like a tackled stair, which to the high top gallant of my joy must be my convoy in the secret night. Farewell, be trusty, and I'll quit thy pains. Farewell, commend me to thy mistress. So he's saying, you wait behind the church, because my friends are going to come along and bring you a rope ladder, which I can then, you can take it to Juliet, and I'll be able to climb it up to get to her. Now, off you go. The nurse says, now God in heaven bless thee, hark you, sir. So God bless you. And Romeo says, what says thou, my dear nurse? You know, what do you want to say? The nurse says, is your man secret? Did you never hear say two may keep counsel, putting one away? So she's saying, well, this friend that you're going to say, is he trustworthy? Because, you know, the more people you, you tell about a plan, the more it can go wrong. Romeo says, I warrant thee my man's as true as steel. So yeah, he says, um, trustworthy as steel. And the nurse says, well, sir, my mistress is the sweetest lady. Lord, Lord, when t'was a little prating thing, oh, there is a noble man in town, one Paris, that would fain lay knife aboard, for she, good soul, has as leaf see a toad, a very toad, as see him. I anger her sometimes and tell her Paris is the proper man, but I'll warrant you when I say so. She looks as pale as any clout in the versal world. Doth not Rosemary and Romeo begin both with a letter? So basically the nurse is saying, oh, Juliet's the sweetest girl, starts going off into this reminiscence of a story, oh, when she was a baby, then forgets that and says, oh, there's a, there's a guy in Paris who wants to marry her, but she doesn't want to marry him. Uh, she'd rather look at a toad than him. And I deliberately wind her up sometimes by saying Paris is better looking than you, Romeo. And when I say it, she goes pale. And then says, doesn't Rosemary... And Romeo begin with the same letter. Now, Rosemary is a symbol of remembrance for the dead. So there's a little metaphor there. And Romeo says, I, nurse, what of that? Both with an R. So, yeah, yeah, they begin with the letter R. Now, the nurse thinks he's joking and says, oh, mocker, that's the dog's name. R is for the no. I know it begins with some other letter. And she hath the prettiest sententious of it, of you and Rosemary though it would do you good to hear it. So she thinks Romeo's joking, saying, no, R is the name of the dog. Um, it's a different letter that they both start with. So, you know, just this is just a comic moment revealing the nurse to be a pretty ridiculous character. Romeo says, commend me to thy lady, speak well of me to Juliet. And the nurse says, I a thousand times, I will a thousand times. And off goes Romeo. And the nurse says, Peter. Peter says, I'm ready. Peter, take my fan and go before in a pace. So you walk ahead. And that's the end of this scene. Well, if you found this video useful, please do pick up the ebook, which contains a translation of every line of the play into modern English, an analysis of every scene, and a video for every section of the book, too. It's just £1.99. Follow the links in the description.
Hello everybody and welcome to this video analysing Act 2 Scene 4 of Romeo and Juliet. As always, please do give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Well, as in previous scenes, there's a, a strong sense of foreshadowing in Act 2 Scene 4. Mercutio tells Benvolio, alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead. Now he's talking in jest about Romeo being dead in love, but of course what he says will soon come true. And once again, this heavy reliance on foreshadowing backs up the theme of fate in the play, the idea that the events in life are predetermined and set, and there is nothing we can do to stop them. Perhaps sensing the plot was becoming too serious, Shakespeare introduces humour through the nurse's use of malapropisms. Now, a malapropism is the misuse of a word for humorous effect. And the word which is used will often sound similar to the correct word, but has a very different meaning. So let me give you an example. When the nurse says to Romeo, I'll tell her, talking about Juliet, I'll tell her that you do protest, which, as I take it, is a gentleman-like offer. Now, she didn't actually mean to use the word protest. She meant to use the word propose. So what she meant to say is I will tell her that you propose, which is a gentleman-like offer. And as you can see, the undesired meaning is the complete opposite of what was meant. So this is a comic moment when you add it together with the other examples, and there are three or four malapropisms in this scene. Time plays a key role in Act 2, Scene 4. Romeo tells the nurse that Juliet should meet him at the church this afternoon to be married. Having met the previous evening, Romeo and Juliet will be married within 24 hours of meeting. And from their initial meeting to their marriage, they'll only speak around a thousand words to each other. The audience is surely left wondering how real this love can be. In the previous scene, Friar Lawrence scolded Romeo's professions of love for Rosaline by telling him, Thy love did read by rote and could not spell. So it seems Rosaline knew that Romeo's love for her was not real. But 13-year-old Juliet is completely bewitched by him. Of course, there are many who believe that Romeo is truly in love, and it's possible that Romeo is now reformed from his previous wicked ways with Rosaline and is devoted to Juliet in all sincerity. That is pretty much the traditional interpretation of the character. But if you're studying this text for an assessment of some kind, it's always useful to offer alternative interpretations. So that means you take a quotation... You explain what it means and then you think, could it have a different meaning? At the end of the day, none of us know exactly what Shakespeare meant through his presentation of Romeo, but an open mind to a variety of interpretations will help you to improve your grade. So this is only a very short video, but there is a video on every uh, scene of the whole play translated into modern English and analysed. And it all is uh, written down in my ebook. so follow the link in the description and please pick up a copy, it really helps.